that means that the good has been privatized, which is to say, nobody can really tell you what kind of life is worthy of your humanity. You have to determine mm. that. Right. And I thought, well, mm. whew, uh, if I have to do that, and actually one of, uh, one of my students, our students said that, you know, people have been thinking about this question for 3,000 years, and now I'm supposed to do that in in uh, in a matter of uh, one one course at Yale, or I <laughs> ought to have determined that uh, even before I took a course. I ought to have known it just by be, having been born, and it doesn't make any sense. Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast, and I hope this next episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you enjoy it, Hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, that way you'll never miss a thing. So pastors, I know how difficult it can be to keep your sermons feeling fresh and relevant, especially when you're preaching week after week. So whether you're hitting a writer's block or you're in a rush because it's Friday and you're trying to put the finishing touches on your sermon, things don't always go as planned. So to help you, I've created a 10-step preaching cheat sheet. After decades of preaching, I've simplified the whole process of preparation into a series of steps and reminders that can help me and you ensure that our sermons are engaging, relevant, and memorable. Super easy to use, 10 simple prompts with examples, and you can start using it as early as this Sunday. So just go to preachingcheatsheet.com or click the link in the description. You'll get a copy sent to you for free today. Today's episode is also brought to you by Compassion. Words are powerful, but as a communicator, it's far too easy to underestimate the impact of experiences. So when people experience God in a way that is outside their usual rhythms and routines, lives change. That's why I encourage you to bring a compassion experience to your church. It's an interactive way to witness the realities of life for children in poverty and the church's incredible response. Families in your community will see how the gospel is transforming lives around the world. And because not everybody can go on a mission trip, you can bring the experience to you. Compassion is currently working with the local church to release over 2.2 million children from poverty in Jesus' name. And I have personally supported them for years. To learn more, go to compassion.com slash carry. And now to today's episode. Miroslav, welcome to the podcast. Well, so good to be your guest and to meet you. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's nice to meet you too. I've read you for years, like dating back to seminary, and um, and have quoted you many times in messages. And it's just a, a thrill to be able to connect in uh, for this uh, for this interview. So I'd love to start here. Uh, you started life in Croatia, and I'd love for you to share a little bit about your early life in Croatia with our listeners and how it shaped your theological perspective. Yeah, so uh, I was born in Croatia in a small town uh, by the name of Osijek, and my um, father was at that time uh, in um, training to become a minister so that I grew up uh, later mm -hmm. as a son of a minister. And uh, it was during communist rule, so there was a kind of pressure from various various sides. We were, my parents were Pentecostal, um, uh, which means that of all the churches that were around, we were the minority of the minority, kind of the bottom rank. rank. Mm. And then we all were under pressure from uh, from the communist uh, regime, and it's this kind of setting uh, uh, I have had the privilege to live in a, and grow up in a family where both parents were just incredibly exemplars of um, um, the faith that they espoused. Not that they were perfect, but they were on a journey, in a serious journey into that uh, faith. And then I had this uh, nanny as well, who was uh, one of the most beautiful human beings that I've ever met, a very simple uh, woman. So uh, this was this was uh, in the midst of um, what one might describe persecution, in the midst of uh, want and poverty. This was, a, this was paradise for me growing up. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting because, I mean, most of our listeners were probably born in America or Canada or the West, uh, most are American, where really we haven't known war. You have to go overseas for war, but it's very different to, I imagine, experience that. And I read a quote, the internet isn't always right, that your father found God in the hell of a communist labor camp 
and uh, talk a little bit more about your father and the life, because you were born obviously after the Second World War, but your father was born in the midst of it. What what happened to him? Yeah, my father was born a little bit uh, before before the Second World War, and uh, toward the end, uh, he turned eighteen, which means that he was conscripted into a regular army, and wow. in which he was a baker. Um, he himself had communist sympathies. He lost the job, uh, uh, striking together with the communists. Uh, with the communists, uh, and then lo and behold, uh, after the um, uh, Nazis were uh, were uh, were driven driven out, uh, and after the partisan victory, together with the Allies, he found himself uh, for no fault of his own uh, on the wrong side, and what. Uh, the communists did at that time, they had organized these death marches. Uh, and he was on one of those death marches and he survived death march, survive, survive also labor camp. But in the process, he who had some kind of a connection to faith became uh, consumed by anger against God. And it is out of this both tremendous suffering where his life was hanging on a thread from day to day and that anger against uh, the situation that shouldn't be to him as an innocent person that he felt that he was rescued. And suddenly he found a way to affirm God's goodness uh, right there in the hell of the whole uh, experience. Um, It was mediated by um, an incredibly saintly and somehow foolish also a uh, young man who was his became his very close friend and yet through that man god spoke to him and he was transformed almost in an instant nothing changed in the situation everything changed uh, just mm. because he himself has changed so what what was a death march I mean, I think most of oh, us have heard about them, but what, what, what did that involve? It, it's a very simple simple idea. The, you, you, you have a group, in this particular case, was of a thousand people, and many such groups were, uh, were uh, in uh, uh, Croatia at that time. Uh, you start um, walking them. Uh, you don't feed them. Uh, you they sleep wherever they they stop uh, and you give them maybe you feed them uh, 200 calories a day is what my father was getting uh, and you march for 50 kilometers a day and oh. uh, if you have a uh, good shoes you are very lucky uh, unless guards take those shoes uh, from you and replace with their own lousy ones if you don't you fall behind and then uh, you're shot. Uh, so after about a month and a half of marching, or I'm not sure exactly, but the month and maybe, a half, about at 30 two, miles a day, 50 kilometers a day. Right. Wow. And sometimes they would stop for a few days and then then continue. After about a month and a half or two, I'm not sure exactly uh, the length, it's very hard to reconstruct it. Uh, of 1,000 that started, my father estimated that 700 remained. That's a death march. And the Nazis or the communists put them on this death mat march? Uh, communists put them, uh, wow. uh, suspecting that all of them who were in regular Croatian army and others were somehow um, um, uh, collaborators, that they were guilty for uh, of crimes against humanity. So uh, this was kind of a general, let's get anybody who is in any way associated with previous regime, put them on the death march, and we'll see what happens. 700 people died in his unit. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. You know, that that, that really seems surreal. And I'm, I know you've read Viktor Frankl, but amazing things did happen. Horrible, horrendous, unspeakable things happened in the death camps and the labor camps. I think yeah. my grandfather was in a labor camp as well during the Second World War, although we never got any family details about that. But anytime I asked him about it, he just shuddered, looked down, didn't want to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, no, no that, that, that's right. For a long time, my father did not want to talk about it at all. Uh, and then he 
put things down on the paper. I have about uh, 70 pages of his uh, notes, maybe a little bit more, about what happened to him, his life story, and in the context of life story, how he found uh, faith there. And I think he was able to write about it because it was not all horror for him. Uh, but in the midst of the horror, there was this surprising uh, ray of light that uh, lightened him up from the from from inside, and he was immensely grateful for that. Obviously, always uh, remembering with pain what he has had endured, but at the same time able to kind of not take the experience that he had had uh, being uh, on the verge of death for such a long time as kind of a character of the world. It was, he, he was able to affirm the goodness of the world notwithstanding. And that made it possible for him to live and to live um, uh, in, in uh, uh, an extraordinary and beautiful life, actually. Well, we're going to get to your teachings on suffering and justice, because I think they, they've been so formative for so many people. But what do you think it was, having known your father and read his writings, that allowed him to see the good in the midst of what most people would describe as a living hell, and, and, and then also give thanks in that situation? Yeah, yeah. And, and to shift from, uh, in the matter of hours— from curses um, that uh, were almost coming straight down from hell to this recognition that for the meager meal that he had and which wouldn't supply calories that he uh, used up during that day to give thanks for that. that that's, that's what transpired. And it's, n it's not easy for me to understand what, to me, it seems like it's very hard to motivate that with reason. What, what are the reasons for it? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that, uh, that I know. I know that it wouldn't have happened had he not in in, uh, encountered there a person who was consistently loving toward him under those circumstances. Wow. Um, okay. And in the sacrificial kinds of ways, uh, who was then the same person who was talking to him about God, about mm. love of God. Um, so, so he didn't just talk. If he just had he just talked, uh, it would have only um, strengthened his cursing and 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 magnified it. Uh, but he embodied it, and. Mm. Um, wrought a transformation and I you know I'm a theologian I'm a Christian I would ascribe it yeah. to the spirit of God yeah. who takes what isn't and makes something out of it who takes what is completely warped and transforms it into something beautiful do you see parallels between your father's experience from what you can derive of it and what Viktor Frankl wrote about in Man's Search for Meaning and his work and because he was in um, in the worst of the the, the death camps, yeah, I, I think uh, I think there is a, a connection between um, a kind of sense of meaning, sense of um, that this is not that it, this does not have the last word. I have something to live for beyond this, something good beyond this exists, and I live for that in the midst of that, right? I think that's wow. roughly Frankl's uh, take, on, take on this. Mm -hmm. And those who were able to uh, have a meaning, which is to say who were able to identify the good beyond the experience, were able uh, to survive in an easier way. So I think there are important analogies between what Frankl describes about my father experienced. Yeah, um, you know, that, that kind of makes me want to jump down to your writing on suffering, which has been formative for so many people. And I want to quick kick off one quote um, from you to sort of start the discussion. And the quote is this, The principle cannot be denied. The fiercer the struggle against the injustice you suffer, the blinder you will be to the injustice you inflict. 
we tend to translate the presumed wrongness of our enemies into an unfaltering conviction of our own rightness. I thought that was so, so good. Um, do you want your, your stuff, your, your writing on suffering is among the best I've ever read. And I'd love your um, commentary on that idea, that thought. Uh, yeah, you're very kind. Uh, a lot, a lot of great people have written about uh, suffering. So thank mm. you. Um, well, you know, it's a uh, w- once you attach yourself deeply to something, and there is nothing that attaches you as deeply to someone else, uh, and attach you in a perverse way as the one who you are fighting against the struggle mm-hmm. against uh is um holds you tied to that person you struggle against and in that struggle um uh, uh influence of the other the shape of the other the behavior of the other or behavior of each party uh starts to assimilate and be very much alike and that's what mm. it's so difficult to struggle against evil on evil's terms without at the same time in the same process losing your own soul uh mm. and the struggle for for the beauty of the self uh in ugly situations which oppresses one is some of the uh, most difficult struggle that we that we have. You know, my father uh, is a good example. He couldn't. Basically, mm. the 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 action against him caused the reaction that only lacked means to uh, to play itself play itself out in violence, and therefore it expresses it, uh, itself in this incredible fury. Um, and this, to me, is. Um, uh, extraordinary uh, about Christian and Christ teaching and Christian message uh, more generally uh, that if somebody strikes you on one, turn the other cheek when they strike you on one. And this is to break the automatism of uh, reactive relationship. Uh, to the one who is your enemy and assert one's own sovereignty and sovereignty of of the good that then defeats the one who, um, even if you lose, uh, enemy as enemy has been defeated, enmity of the enemy has been defeated, which is, uh, I I think, a a tremendous victory. Mm. Yeah, because, I mean, there's a certain sense, you know, where you argue that in fighting oppression, you can, it's not that hard to become the oppressor. It's not that hard to adopt the tactics yeah. of the enemy to try to defeat the enemy. And and I wonder if in some ways, we're definitely, you know, those of us who live in North America are not, I'm not trying to equate this to what happened in the Second World War or in other war zones around the world, but you've almost seen weaponized politics in the last decade or so really emerge, right? Where if you're a conservative, you hate all progressives and you're almost willing to, some, not all, but some are willing to adopt any tactic to try to defeat them. And the same with the left to the right. They hate the right and whatever I have to do in the name of love to defeat someone on the right wing, I will do, even if it turns me into the oppressor. Do you see that playing out in more and more of our culture where people are willing to inflict injustice on others in the name of justice? Yeah, I I think once you have a very hardened front, uh, and when people think that uh, a very much is at stake, uh, that's what tends to uh, happen. And the question Mm. is, how does one bear witness to Christ uh, mm. in this kind of situation? Uh, and and how does one bear witness in such a way that one doesn't give up on the question of justice itself, right? Because we have, we bring sense of justice uh, and rightness uh, to our engagements. And I don't think the way to overcome the tension when justices clash 
is to say, well, let's forget about the justice. Let's organize our life fully about around something else. I think what we need to do is affirm the claims of justice, but at the same time show uh, a, a overarching and encompassing grace. That, that may be a little bit abstractly put, but you can illustrate that when you think about, uh, say, forgiveness. When I forgive somebody, I implicitly affirm and state that they have wronged me, which is to say I affirm the claims of justice um, uh, with respect to the behavior of that person. But I, at the same time, do not let that count against them. And this affirmation, while transcending at the same time, I think it's an essential element in the process of reconciliation uh, when uh, fronts are very, very, uh, very hard. I mean, it's easier to do that in interpersonal relations than it is in group uh, relations, yeah. um, and because they have their own inner uh, dynamic. And so the question really is for us to have, uh, or for me in particular, let's put it in first person, uh, uh, for me to have a wisdom what and how in the situation as it is, highly polarized, how to bear witness to something that is beyond the struggle, something that binds the two and the power of love and the power of grace. Mm. Do you think Martin Luther King Jr. embodied that well, what you're talking about? I'm trying to think of current examples. Yeah, I mean, uh, from, from all that I know of MLK, uh, he was extraordinary just, just in this regard. And I think he was extraordinary because uh, he was always saw that beloved community <laughs> on the mm. horizon uh and wouldn't let the vision of beloved community be uh undermined by de facto community of uh, hatred or the, uh, the 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 struggle uh that often had uh, had the forms of of hatred so that his own struggle was guided by this by this vision which i think is is quite Quite extraordinary. Uh, I think Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, has done something similar in South Africa. I, I think also uh, Gandhi, who's influenced both of these, has done something like that. And uh, uh, the same, I think, uh, Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in many ways. But it's interesting. I was reading recently that King, at the time of his assassination, was one of the most uh, poorly thought of people in America. Like his opinion ratings, so to speak, were quite yeah. low. He he's his his the opinion has changed over time. Uh, well, another I quote think, of your yeah. Go, go ahead. ahead. I, I think it's partly because the critique uh, of America shifted away from, uh, or his concern shifted uh, shifted partly away, or was was uh, supplemented by. Um, by the concern uh, both about the war in Vietnam, uh, war in Vietnam, but mm -hmm. also about economic issues. It wasn't simply about race issues, but it was also mm -hmm. about economic issues. And there, he was perceived uh, as uh, undermining something that's even more fun foundational um, than uh, kind of race uh, relations. Mm. Another thing that a lot of people in the West struggle with, and I've, I've so appreciated your voice on this, is they have a problem with the idea of justice. So we've been talking about the Second World War. We've been talking about deep oppression so far in the podcast. But, you know, if you have someone who was raised in the suburbs, who's had a, a moderately decent life, they'll look at the whole idea of justice or retribution. And I'm thinking particularly when it comes theologically to God, this idea that God is going to set the record straight at some point. And they think that's just unfair or it's cruel. Like, shouldn't we just love everybody? Shouldn't we just get along? And it's a, it's a very, you know, superficial marshmallowy type view of how humans should react. Or even this idea that there should be repercussions for our behavior is looked down on in some circles. What is your response to that commonly held sentiment or other sentiments like it? Well, I, I think it doesn't take seriously um, the effect of the wrongdoing. 
uh, not just upon the victim, but also upon the whole environment in which we in which we find ourselves. And it seems to me that the sentiment is possible only if you find yourself in a kind of um, cozy suburban situation where you are de facto protected by uh, a military of the state, uh, by the state and military and and the police. And then mm. now you have the luxury of just wanting to to embrace uh, embrace everyone. You know, my five year old daughter does that, and I kind of think this is absolutely fantastic that she <laughs> she does that. It's sweet and it's beautiful, but it's predicated on the house in which she lives being uh, being safe, uh, and which for me then uh, then then means that um, a kind of sense of the importance of drawing lines uh, when question of justice uh, are concerned uh, ought to be emphasized and and not diminished what i tend to be against um and fairly sturdily is not so much um uh, about uh, not so much against kind of disciplinary measures uh i'm against retribution Mm. Uh, retribution, uh, uh, justice, uh, and meeting out uh, just desserts as in the form of retribution. That seems to me not quite right, and not quite right for Christians. Uh, I can understand why other people might want that, but I as a Christian can't, because I think mm. Christ is the end of retribution. Mm. On the cross, God took the sin of the world upon God's self. But that doesn't mean that disciplinary measures are excluded so there one ought to be one ought to um uh, intervene uh, with disciplinary measures uh, my 5 year old daughter there is such a thing as a timeout so mm. and i if she misbehaves if she has broken a promise there's going to be consequences uh, for that, and she understands it too, and I understand it too. It has diminished one slightly, slight, uh, a tiny bit our love for for each other, but it's got to be, it's got to be there. I think question uh, then becomes, uh, to what degree in society at large is actually are our laws aligned with justice? Is our penal system aligned with justice? There's quite a bit of room for reformation there, but this is not a fundamental calling into question. Uh, both the claims of justice that have to be affirmed, as well as um, a kind of form of discipline that needs to be sometimes uh, implemented. It's more how than whether. Yeah, and that, see, that's what I really appreciate about it. On the one hand, you've got people who are like, there should never be any kind of penalty for anything, and God loves everybody, and we love everybody, and like everybody just get along. On the other hand, you can have people who are into exactly, as you say, retribution. It's like, no, you know, we need vengeance. And um, it's the shelter of the suburbs that often produces yeah. sort of the, the weirdness in that. So where is the line? Like, what do you do uh, with that whole concept of justice? Because I think most people listening to this podcast, they're leading people who hold one of those two views. Either, oh, let's all hold hands and get along and there's no wrong and there's no right and there's, there's no implications. Or uh, let's get a mob and go take care of this in our own hands or let me meet out justice you know the way i see it so how how do you what do you what do you propose we do with that tension? well uh, i i think it will probably depend on situation in which we in which we find ourselves um i simply think that we need to uh educate people first uh, i think in recognizing how um unsustainable that position is uh, for themselves, uh, and that requires a certain kind of mm -hmm. imagination to put themselves in the situation of the person who has been violated in a serious, uh, serious way. Um, I think we have to also uh, emphasize. I mean, I love this um, this uh, uh, two word command that one finds in First Peter, and it says, "Honor everyone." Two words, mm. honor mm. everyone. Um, 
So even the person with whom I disagree, uh, I need to honor. I need to... That person is part of everyone uh, that this, to, of which this verse speaks. And I think when if you start thinking in those terms, uh, then you suddenly introduce the idea of kind of fundamental, not just respect for a person, but honoring that person in their integrity. And then it seems to me retribution, uh, especially mob violence or anything of that sort, uh, would go slowly out of, uh, out of the window. And mm. I'd invite everyone just to, uh, to kneel under the cross of Christ and meditate for a while what God has done with sinful humanity. That's a good challenge. <laughs> I want to talk about some of your influences because you're a voice that that beautifully synthesizes philosophy and theology. How did you come to a love for both fields and disciplines? Mm, that's very that's very. I think the love was um, triggered in me by my uh, brother-in-law. He wasn't yet the brother-in-law. Mm. He was my the fiance of my sister, Peter Kuzmich. Um, and uh, he was this very charismatic, um, ten year older than I wa- than I was, uh, very very well educated, and uh, he started talking to me about uh, theology. He started talking to me about uh, philosophy, and one of the first books that he gave me uh, is, and I had just then fully kind of embraced faith, was Bertrand Russell's Wisdom of the West. One of the most mm. prominent atheists <laughs> in, yeah, yeah. Uh, a, 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 at that at that time. His book, written for a kind of popular popular audience, beautifully written a written book, and that's the book that I started uh, studying, and that's how I developed uh, both love for theology and love for philosophy. And indeed, uh, once I studied theology, I realized how much I need uh, philosophy uh, as well, and so it's been. Um, uh, these two disciplines have been constantly in, in dialogue uh, in my own life, as well as uh, as other sources of um, knowledge of wisdom, um, psychology I've appreciated, sociology I've always appreciated quite quite a bit, uh, and not to forget literature. I, it's, I'm I'm very I'm fond of literature. I love to read uh, books, and early on I, I devoured Dostoevsky and Hermann Hesse and folks of this sort. What else has shaped your, what other influences have shaped your thinking and your writing, Miroslav? You've listed a few, but uh, any other major influences in how your thinking has developed? Uh, well, I mean, I mentioned earlier that, that really uh, probably the most significant influence are the lives of these uh, crucial people in my early development, my nanny, my father, and my my mother. And in some ways, I'm trying to articulate uh, uh, a kind of life that they've lived uh, for a different situation and in different uh, mode. Um, to me, that was, that, that, that was really crucial. And then at one point, uh, I discovered Martin Luther. And now this is mm. Martin Luther is is a is a strange person to uh, to discover and to in some ways as I did to fall in love with, because I mean I yeah, can he's sort I of can, a strange uh, person too. <laughs> I can rattle <laughs> yeah. down uh, down the list of uh, undesirable features of that uh, that person. He's a he has a lot of warts. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, and some serious uh, ones, uh, uh, including his relation to folks uh, like like my folks, who were both kind of with pacifist uh, leanings and uh, and Baptists, uh, adult Baptists, so kind of not quite Anabaptist strand, but roughly in that uh, mm-hmm. in that line. And then come the Jews, and then come the Catholics. Who's not on that list? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> and yet, some of the most beautiful uh, theological writings, uh, mm-hmm. in my uh, estimation, something uh, a text like on the freedom of Christian, 
uh, or um, his commentary on Magnificat uh, or his Heidelberg Disputation uh, have been so influential and they they influence mm. and shape my thinking uh, all the way to today. I had to kind of adjust it. I have to tinker with it. Uh, I have to um, uh, make it applicable. Um, and uh, but, but it's been very important. And then my own teacher, Jürgen Moltmann, was very, very influential. Uh, and yeah, I remember his advice to me when I just graduated, got my PhD, and I, uh, I thought to myself, what now? Uh, I've gotten this PhD. How do I write? Uh, how do I become a real theologian? Uh, this is kind of a uh, um, uh, rite of passage that I have passed. Uh, and then I, so I asked him, what, what should I do? How, what would you advise me? And he said, uh, found, find things that move people and shed the light of the gospel on them. And I thought that was hmm. such a simple but very useful hmm. advice. Identify uh, kind of the, the sighs and the groans uh, and the joys uh, of people and, and shine the light of the gospel, um, which for him meant also that theology was always tied to life. It's a theology close hmm. to life, not theology that is simply dogmatic, that is simply about rightness of beliefs or rightness even of action, but it's a theology that is kind of serves the life uh, life in 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 its multiplicity of its uh, expression, um, and I found that to be uh, very life giving to me as a, as a person, and suddenly I could. Uh, with this advice, suddenly I could write theology about anything and everything. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating. Which you did. Yeah. You, you've covered a lot of things. So Moltmann, I believe he's still alive. Is he that is. true? Is he like 97, 98? Wow. 90, 97. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, where is it? I've got it right here. His, uh, his letter uh, that he sent to folks uh, at, for his 97th uh, birthday. Resurrection wow. to eternal life is my hope in life and in death. Huh. The eternal life has to be lived. This is the life of the new creation. And therefore, death is the birthday to new life in God's reign, in God's kingdom. Hmm. I'm Translating directly from German, so so it may not you are. <laughs> it may not be uh, be be the best English, but but you get the get the point. That's wonderful. Yeah, for those, I mean, if you've been to seminary, you've definitely heard about Jürgen Moltmann. But for those who may not be familiar with his work, can you? I mean, it's hard to summarize a career as big as his, but uh, what he's known for and why that was so significant to others and to you. Yeah, uh, I, I think. He, his own articulation of uh, a theology of hope, uh, and this was written in the in the uh, kind of sixties, Kennedy era. Hope was uh, in the air everywhere, and yet he picked up this notion of hope, but then gave it a, a really Christian uh, and and uh, theological twist, because generally people then associated hope with optimism. Uh, and maybe hope, yes. hope is associated with um, kind of reasonable expectation that things are going to be better in certain regards, right? And we hope then mm. for those. We can be uh, hopeful for that. And, and Moltmann ba basically pushed that notion aside, kind of extrapolation from the present into the future and then optimism as a result or pessimism for uh, w w whichever yeah. it is. And he said, the uh, hope is rooted not in the potentialities of the present, but in the promise of God that speaks to the future. God promises, and in God's promise is the foundation of the better future that we that, that we have. To me, that 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 was uh, transformative. I don't have to be dependent about the situation today in order to move mm. into the future with hope. To the contrary, I can be hopeful even when circumstances are hopeless. Uh, and that's the experience of my father. 
what was this idea of mm. discovering goodness? Then from the other angle, seeing suddenly there's this burst of hope where there was only darkness and only impossibility to think what might come uh, next, uh, he's able to live a life not just in faith in goodness and trust in God, but also reaching out into the future. I, I, I think it's, just, uh, it's marvelous. His book, The Cru- Crucified God, uh, about yeah. God's suffering, uh, solidarity with us, it's a beautifully and powerfully written book. I, I, th- there, there are things I disagree in it, uh, and, but it's been published 50 years ago. I've just written a, a text for uh, 50th anniversary for a, a journal in China, where he's very popular, actually, as a, as a theologian, uh, and reminded me one more time how incredibly powerful and important that, that book is. And what I love about his work is that it's so centered on Christ and so theological. He doesn't, he doesn't make decisions about things, and then say, "Well, how do I find some theological reasons for to believe what I believe in any case?" Um, mm. And that seems to me uh, really refreshing. That's that's how I want to do my theology. It's actually our commitments to God uh, that drive what we ought to think, how we ought to live. Um, God is truly our home because God hope because God is the source of all goodness and Jürgen was able to think that and articulate that in the ways that are also compelling to uh, non-believers. I have seen him give a lecture in uh, we were in Beijing together. Uh, there were about three thousand people gathered intellectuals from various parts of the world, uh, many, many from from China. If I had to guess, I would have guessed maybe 80% of them did not believe in God. They, you know, and they thought religion was kind of left over from some previous time, if not harmful. He gave a lecture in which I could recognize all the key features of his theology. And after he finished, he got standing ovation. I thought it was incredible. I, and well, after he fin- finished asking, Jürgen, how do you do that? <laughs> I don't think he answered it for me. Certainly not. Was say, what did you say? <laughs> certainly, not, certainly not in a way that I could emulate uh, <laughs> and do the same. <laughs> Well, and I think that's reflected in your writing, too. It's a beautiful alternative to, if you listen to a lot of preaching, and I may have been guilty of this, it's like hope comes when you figure it out and you get a little bit better at it. In other words, Mm -hmm. here are the five keys to X, Y, Z, and there is your hope, which of course is not true, but it can come across that way. Or some of the, you know, devotional stuff, which feels good, but it doesn't last through your next crisis. And to solidly root things in the resurrection of Jesus in an intellectually compelling way is a rarer and rarer skill all the time. Yeah. Uh, bizarre question for you. How many languages do you speak and or read and write? I'm just curious because you must be, you've studied in different countries. You just translated directly from German. I mean, and this would include biblical languages as well. I'm just curious because that'll tee up my next question. Uh, well, I, I think it depends what, what it means to really, really, really know a uh, language. It's, it's a, I don't know a single language uh, uh, properly, uh, but I, I speak I use uh, uh, um, and I write uh, I can write in uh, English German and Croatian I can read uh, f- some French with with, a, with with the help of a dictionary and I regularly read my Greek New Testament um, that's uh, mm-hmm. roughly where uh, my language capacities stop but I need I need to help sometimes with dictionaries and uh, so forth but I love languages now uh, I only speak English, and I still use a dictionary and thesaurus from time to time. Same, so same I, here. I don't think, same here in any language. Yeah. 
So, I mean, that's five, just to name a few to get started. And I imagine you have some familiarity with others. Uh, it's, it's curious to me because I'm really unilingual. I know a tiny bit of French, a little bit. Well, I can't even say I know Dutch but in other languages. But, uh, you know, certainly not enough to read and write in them. But I think it really shapes your worldview to understand. For example, Ger- Germans have concepts for words and ideas that just have no direct translation. The same with Chinese or other languages. I'm just wondering how your knowledge of multiple languages and cultures has helped you see the world perhaps a little bit differently than somebody who's only lived in one culture. You know, that's that's a that's a good question. I never I never uh, actually carefully thought uh, about it. I mean, uh, uh, I, what you say seems exactly right, that language is, yeah. is a kind of a way of seeing the world. Uh, which is a slightly different depending which language you uh, you you use, but how what kind of how does a crossover go so that mm-hmm. um, what I see in one language I kind of transpose and experience in the other uh, as well, or how do these things uh, where do, where are they if they're not in language when they're in me right if they're kind of there's mm-hmm. something from from multiple languages that's there, but uh, how how is it expressed? How does it reside there? I'm I'm a little bit uncertain about that. To need mind yeah. like Augustine's to uh, to to decipher this. <laughs> Well, it's something to think about yeah. too, because I think we're we're all bound by our context. But you know, I think one of the reasons your voice has resonated so much on suffering, for example, Miroslav, is because of the stories you shared about your father and your mother and growing up in Croatia and under communist rule. I mean, you were born into a communist country, and you're able to take those contexts that that experience and speak into a suburban context which you now live in as a professor at Yale, in a way that somebody born in Boston might never have those kinds of insights. And it's really curious to me. I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that those of us who are unilingual, including myself, have a reduced perspective because of our monolingualism. But maybe that's just me. I don't know. Yeah, and, and then maybe, maybe also a kind of years of, of living in different uh, cultural settings. Uh, it mm-hmm. it gives you vantage points um, from which you see what you're experiencing that is different from those who are just living from within a particular culture. And it was helpful for me to live in um, kind of three uh, different cultures for extended periods uh, of time so that I became steeped in the ways of thinking and ways of acting in the culture. And that gives you perspective. Yeah, and those three cultures, just to clarify, were uh, so which, which in, cultures? in Croatia, former Yugoslavia, um, uh, the uh, and then I spent about nine years in Germany, and mm-hmm. now in the United States for a number of years. Yeah, how did Croatia change? I mean, I remember the collapse of communism in 1989. You know, you look at. Croatia then compared to Yugoslavia before. Uh, I've talked to people from East Berlin and West Berlin, and you see the differences there. I'm speaking in Germany in 2024, so I'm very anxious <laughs> to sort of go a little bit deeper on that uh, when I get there. But I'm, I'm curious how you have seen your country change. Uh, also talked to someone from Romania recently who says, oh no, we're very much still influenced by the dictators, even though, you know, I was born in the 80s, just a few years before uh, Ceausescu, I think it was in Romania, fell, mm-hmm. etc. Uh, have you noticed a big change or how has that impacted the mindset, uh, let alone the living conditions of, of people in the last 35 years or whatever it yeah. is. Yeah, living conditions have changed quite quite dramatically. Yeah. Um, um, I think culture has also uh, shifted uh, kinds of um, expectations from the state that one had uh, um, kinds of um, indifferences about the state in some ways because you couldn't change uh, anything. Um, that has shifted. I think people are also uncertain about um, 
how does one survive in the highly competitive uh, culture with uh, such crass differences in uh, in wealth and in opportunity? Mm-hmm. Um, it's um, it's hard for me to assess. Uh, I I haven't been there for five years, so I'm um, uh, because of the COVID, <laughs> and I'll be going in in uh, August, and uh, I'll have my eyes open, uh, open. and see yeah. what what has actually transpired, even in in those five years. Uh, but on the other, there there is also, uh, for instance, when I listen to. Uh, 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 Stories about how Croatian education, for instance, it's pretty impressive what what people are people are doing. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, as as I remember the last time I spoke in Germany, which was a few years ago now, uh, we had a hint. There were two things I remember. One is be careful how you talk about leadership. And one person just whispered to me, "We had a leader once, and we know yeah. how that went." So be careful. Yeah. And secondly, the Germans want everything practical, hyper, hyper practical. Where's the manual? I mean, and if you've ever driven a, a German car, you understand the engineering is precise. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. they're like, enough with the vision. Where's the manual? I'm like, <laughs> okay, so I'll get ready for that. Next time I'm in Germany, a Romanian uh, gentleman I met Uh, came over from Romania when he was young, but is part of a Romanian church in California, etc. And he just said to me, he said, you know, I understand what Dave Ramsey says about you need a six-month emergency fund. He said, in Romania, we would never do that. I'm like, well, why not? And he said, because if there was anyone in need in our community, we would be there for them. Nobody lives on the street. Nobody needs six months. Like we lived under communist rule and we realized we have to band together to really help each other. And he said, so even if it was the person nobody liked in our community that fell on hard times, lost their job, was going to lose their house, we would all pool our resources and help them. And I'm like, wow. And he said, what made me think of that is you said the hyper-competitive West. You're right. It's sort of dog eat dog, every person for himself or herself. And it's just different mindsets. And I think sometimes when we're raised, I was raised in North America, I spent a lot of time in the U.S. these days. We can sort of impose our own culture on the world and assume that's how everybody thinks, but it's not the case. So Miroslav, I've got a quote from Socrates hanging on the wall down in my office just behind me. And it simply says, an unexamined life is not worth living. Uh, I take it from a life worth living that you would agree with that. Um, any comments on Socrates' thought that an unexamined life is not worth living? And then I'd love a little bit more on, uh, you know, why you wrote a book called Life Worth Living. Mm. Um, yeah, I love that quote. Um, uh, at the same time, I, I, I kind of think it's insufficient, right? But, uh, my always question is, yeah. well, after you examine it, what happens then? <laughs> where, where do you go from <laughs> from there? Uh, or I ask myself, uh, well, from what vantage point, with what kinds of values, are you examining mm. your life in the light of what are you uh, are you doing that? And um, which is simply to say, not to devalue that uh, that um, uh, claim, uh, but it's simply to say, it's almost like a examination is is a kind of midpoint uh, you start from a certain mm-hmm. standpoint you examine you make steps uh, you look back examine and make steps which which is to say uh framed by value and the journey uh, if you have a journey then uh, then examination uh, makes makes sense and it would seem that uh, a life that isn't examined Life that is just lived and not reflected upon would be, well, how should I put it? Kind of below the dignity of the worthiness of that, of human life. It would be uh, as if one couldn't and didn't appreciate the beauty, the complexity, the challenge the risk of of a life and i think we as human beings are created of course we say uh, by god but we're created as unfinished mm-hmm. and we are also spiritually free and this mm-hmm. unfinished nature of us that we are always in construction and that we and uh, and our freedom at the same time 
they require and place into our hands responsibility for our lives. And therefore, we face the question, well, what kind of life is truly worthy of our humanity that we have been given? Because we're free, we can go one direction or the other. And depending on what direction we go, we might lose not so much our foundational humanity, but humanness mm. of our humanity. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I, I really agree with that. And it seems the older I get, the more I'm asking the question. Mm. You know, as I move through my 50s, I'm thinking very much about what is a meaningful life in your 60s, your 70s, your 80s. And I'm sort of systematically rejecting the retirement on a beach as an option <laughs> and trying to think about, you know, I get enough vacation. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think about contribution and everything. Now, this book started out as a class at Yale. You're on faculty at Yale along with your co-authors. Uh, and I think that the course is actually called Life Worth Living, isn't it? It is, yes. At Yale? Yes. Yeah, and you didn't know whether anybody would come and there's like a waiting list it's impossible to get into. What has the experience of that course been like? Tell us about it. Well, um, we we didn't know how the course will uh, will, will go. Uh, we uh, had a sense that we are in a cultural moment in which we kind of park the question of the truly meaningful uh, life, of course. People also think about it, but in general, we kind of f follow our dreams and the advice that you generally mm -hmm. get uh, when everything is said and done. But what you really need to do is you've got to follow your dreams, which is to say you follow your deep desires uh, of, your, of your heart. And that means that the good has been privatized, which is to say nobody can really tell you what kind of life is worthy of your humanity. You have to determine mm. that. Right. And I thought, well, mm. whew, uh, if I have to do that, and actually one of, a, one of my students, our students said that, you know, people have been thinking about this question for 3,000 years, and now I'm supposed to do that in, in, uh, in, in a matter of uh, one, one course at Yale, or I <laughs> ought to have determined that uh, even before I took a course. I ought to have known it just by be, having been born, and it doesn't make any sense. And then the second uh, observation is, is that universities uh, at whose center of concern was the question of meaningful life, life worth living, uh, have in recent years kind of marginalized that question so that it became, if it's asked, it is asked on the margins, and universities are about um, uh, explanatory and instrumental reason. And primarily, how do I get from point A, A to point B? What are the most efficient mm. ways? Whatever that point A is and whatever that point B is. And we are asking the question, and we want students to think, what kind of B, what B point is worthy of your in efforts, worthy of your endeavors? And usually... I mean, people, if they start to ask, I mean, there are a few people who ask that question from the outset, but often it comes 10 to 15 years into a career mm. where people somewhere in their mid to late 30s to early 40s go, wait a minute, what is this all about again? I'm, I'm not sure. Mm. Do you find that, of course, at Yale early on, like how does that change that trajectory for some of your students? I think your observation is is very very much correct about those who are ten years into career. I'm finding that this is also observation uh, that applies to students who come to Yale. Um, mm. uh, it's possible that they are kind of pecu peculiar breed of students, uh, those who go to elite uh, elite educational institutions. But I'm not sure that that's the case. You have parents who have push them, and they themselves have pushed themselves and gone through uh, high school and so forth with no clear reason why they're doing everything mm -hmm. that they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's supposed to be done because mm -hmm. I'm supposed to get into some kind of a school. And once they come here, so now I'm here, uh, what do I do now? 
And now I am here with students who are have all been at the top of their high school class, and I'm not yes. anything particular now. <laughs> so who am I now? <laughs> How do I deal with myself, yes. and what's the purpose of my life? Uh, we need to stop this interview right now because I've had that conversation with my adult children <laughs> once too many <laughs> times, Miroslav, where, well, you know, it was funny as the... Uh, yeah, they're in engineering and accounting, and they're like, wait a minute, was this my choice or your choice? I'm like, <laughs> ah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I mean, there was some agency there, but it was pretty clear having two lawyers as parents, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, with a lot of education that our kids, we just kind of assumed our kids were going to go to a good university. Yeah. They were going to be trained in a profession. Yeah. And now that they're in their 20s and one's 31, it's sort of like, hmm, how did I end up in accounting? How did I end up in engineering? Yeah, yeah. And they're not ungrateful. Right. But And I knew as a, the firstborn son of Dutch immigrants, like there was no question I was going to university because my parents didn't go to university. Mm. And I never really questioned it. Yeah. But then I, you know, got to that stage. I guess I didn't really ask why I was there. But you would see that in a lot of schools. It was that pressure to be there, right? And... How does the course help them? Like, what are some of the aha moments or breakthroughs you've seen? Well, we basically uh, 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 make an assumption that um, there, is a, there is a kind of right way to live your life or that philosophers and religious traditions, various, for centuries have claimed that there is the right way to live your life. And instead of simply fumbling around, why don't you take some of those major traditions? We take seven. And let's try to discern what they say about what life is truly worthy of our humanity. And let's stay with it. And let's not take this, their opinions as if they were options on a salad bar. So if you take a little bit of wisdom from one, pull a little bit from the other, and kind of make a little uh, dish for yourself that might fit your own uh, goals and uh, ideas. Like a little but, bit of Buddhism, a little bit of Hinduism, a little bit of Jesus. I was having this conversation at a party on the weekend, literally. Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, I'm open to Jesus, but I also really love Buddha, and I'm like trying to explain Jesus to this person. So continue. Well, yeah. and then I shake it a little bit, uh, and and then I have yeah. my my smoothie, right, <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That is that is spirituality in America today, for sure, and the West. So, yeah. so what we basically say is each of these tradition makes claim to be true. Now, I want you, and if they say. If they claim to be true, which means that they're talking about your life. They're not saying it's true just for people who lived 3,000 years ago. Uh, it's not just true for people who live in this part of the world. Uh, it's true in a more general sense. It's for you. You ought to consider it. And then we wrestle with this, with the question of truth. We break it down, the question for them, what kind of life is truly worthy of our a humanity, and um, they can say, I don't buy it for this and those those reasons. They can, uh, the only thing they can do is say, I just don't like it. Their likes for that moment are irrelevant. What's relevant <laughs> is there's a claim to truth. Try to imagine yourself to live in that, li uh, that life and argue with it. And after... Uh, if, if after arguing for two weeks, which we spend on a, on a tradition like this, maybe a week and a half, but let's go to another one, or you can think whatever you want about it, but we want you to be seriously engaged, which is to say we want you to be seriously engaged with your own self in regard to that particular tradition. Now, that ends up being then transformative for many of them. They've never asked those kinds of questions. They never thought that they had intellectual permission to ask those questions or to pursue them with intellectual rigor. And um, beautiful things happen. They discover things about themselves. And, of course, this is all happening in a seminar, not in a lecture hall. 
So they listen to each other respond, uh, and they engage each other, and they come from different backgrounds with different religious and philosophical perspectives. And you have suddenly this, what we call truth-seeking conversation about the most important question of our lives. It's Mm. beautiful to, to, Mm. to watch. And I find you, I'm successful if I have generated um, intense, engaged, existentially relevant, and transformative conversation. And I think, well, the truth will take care of itself. <laughs> well, and I want to, okay, I wasn't planning on going this direction, but you raise a really good point that made me think, which is we have a lot of pastors listening to this. Mm-hmm. And you quote from the Quran, you quote from uh, Buddha's life, you quote from Jesus, obviously, and your perspective is as a Christian, mm-hmm. right? But there's a lot of pastors who who would be very hesitant, church leaders, would be very hesitant to expose people to another worldview and who would say, well, we're going to have some intellectual rigor, but there's sort of a limit or a lid on that. Mm -hmm. And obviously you're at Yale, you don't have that lid. And that doesn't seem to be your perspective at all. What would you say to those leaders who are a little bit hesitant? Because I think you're right. Everybody who shows up at church today, for the most part, if they're spiritually curious, they probably, number one, you don't probably get a lot of hardcore atheists showing up at your church. You get people who are at least somewhat open. There's a tiny crack of spiritual light shining through that door. And and they probably have a smorgasbord approach because they follow all kinds of people online. They've seen all kinds of documentaries. They've researched it. And you're right. It's like a little bit of Buddha, a little bit of Hinduism, a little bit, well, maybe there's some Jewish traditions or something from Islam that, that seems good. And all world religions are the same. And I do like Jesus and we put it in the smoothie and we blend it up and we drink that. Um, but a lot of pastors want to exclude all the others and talk only about Jesus. What would you say to them about that tendency to want to not invite rigorous intellectual debate or consider other worldviews? Well, it seems to me that um, we we live in a pluralistic environment, and the course is um, taught at uh, Yale College, not Yale Divinity School, primarily Yale College, which mm-hmm. means it's a pluralistic uh, environment and uh, we want to honor the setting in which we find ourselves. At the same time, that pluralistic environment is, as you have mentioned, it kind of refracts itself in the each individual person. It's not that you had have in my class or uh, or or outside in 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 uh, in, in the world more broadly that you have simply people who strictly belong uh, to particular traditions. There, there's a kind of mm-hmm. certain kind of medley of them, as you mentioned, how people uh, approach that and combine different uh, religious and non-religious uh, uh, traditions. True, but. What we try to highlight is that you can't mix and match as you want. You're always guided by certain goals, and that these traditions also uh, name for you uh, kinds of things that matter the most uh, in life. And in the light of these, you have to uh, live live your life. I think for... uh, a kind of Christian audience, it might be interesting to be able to raise to consciousness debated character of variety of these uh, issues that concern the good life. And you might then, which would be completely appropriate, indeed, you would be disappointed if it didn't happen in the church, which then you would contrast with, compare with, uh, the message of Jesus Christ. You might even say, since one is committed that in Jesus Christ, I'm committed that in Jesus Christ uh, is the truth of our lives expressed. Uh, you might also then speak about that truth in the context of these variety of these conflicting uh, opinions. That to me sounds like a like a, a like a very good sermon. 
Yeah, I agree. I agree. And we've done or that. Or series of sermons. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't do that in 38 minutes, for sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I would imagine what you said earlier to intrigue me is, is we all, a lot of people have that smorgasbord. And I think it's really good to say also non-religious traditions. You know, I do intermittent fasting and I'm very fit and uh, I make sure I eat a, a gram of protein for every pound of my weight a day, you know, whatever that happens to be. I do cold plunges. I mean, that's all sort of tied yeah. into the self-improvement spiritual vortex today. But what you pointed out is really good. Uh, Christianity does not have a smorgasbord approach, nor does Judaism, nor does Islam. Hinduism would be the closest thing to it. And is that a revelation to students that like, wait, this smorgasbord thing is new in this culture? How do they respond to that idea that uh, these religions that they're borrowing from do actually hold a claim to truth? Yeah, we try to uh, try to uh, describe to them that, um, and in the book we mention also that it's like a like a making a recipe. Um, you mm. can have different things in the recipe, but you have to have a grand plan of how these various elements <laughs> are going to fit in your in your recipe, and um, and in this you can think of religious traditions as. A kind of grand recipes or models of recipes of a particular kind of a dish. Uh, and you may vary uh, a little bit, but nonetheless, you've got to make sure that 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 things fit together. Otherwise, they're not going to be a, a, a good or healthy meal. There are obvious limits to this, uh, this analogy. Uh, but I think the kind of sense of consistency you see that in Buddhism, you see that in Confucianism, you see that in the different different strands of Hinduism, but you see it certainly in monotheist uh, religion, and you see it in the uh, worldview like uh, utilitarianism. We also read Nietzsche, for instance. Mm. Oh yeah, with, you mentioned with Nietzsche, Nietzsche also, and Bentham. Also, yeah. you can see it. So, uh, so that seems like um, it becomes plausible to people. Uh, that I can just judge that by my likes or dislikes, even though we can describe it as recipe. If you want to be a really good chef and prepare a good meal, you'll have to know something about cooking rather than simply about what is it that I like to mix uh, in this uh, in this thing. And so that that's one of the ways in which we motivate that. And of course, when we introduce a particular uh, religion, we ask them to pay attention how things fit together. Uh, and then they realize, oh, wow, that that actually does fit together. It's not just that I can, anything goes uh, in those uh, traditions. Right. And it's kind of a schooling for them to, uh, to understand. Um, I'm not sure that we always completely persuade them. They may end up taking a class, and then uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a meal that I want to have, and I suppose <laughs> that's their preference if they want to do that. That's each of ours preference, but uh, we've given them opportunity to um, to become better cooks than they normally are. Yeah, yeah, and I, I like that recipe analogy because at a certain point you're not cooking pasta anymore if you keep changing the recipe. It's just yeah, not pasta. Yeah. It's just not soup. It's something else. Um, what, boy, I, I've I've got a lot of questions for you. Let's jump ahead a little bit. I want to ask this: uh, How does our handling of wealth, fame, and power correspond to a well-lived life? You spend quite a bit of time on that wealth, fame, and power because that is the career path. Yeah, I think I think that the wealth, fame, and power are actually means and not the ends. What happens, though, is that we have made an end out of wealth, an end out of fame. So the more, uh, so the goal is to have more wealth. Um, the goal is to have more fame. The goal is to have more power. And um, a friend of mine, a German sociologist, uh, uses often this metaphor, and he says, um, modern human beings are like like a painter who is obsessing over uh, his uh, tools of his uh, art. Um, mm -hmm. over pa paints, 
over brushes, over easel, over uh, uh, air conditioning and light, and obsesses so much that he never or she never starts to paint. Um, mm. And so that's an illustration of what happens when we uh, uh, make money our goal. Money is worth nothing in itself. It's worth something as means to something. Money is the pure means, and yet it becomes an end for us. And when that happens, I think when we lose proper ends, we end up uh, we end up in a in a hamster wheel <laughs> because you constantly chase after more, and uh, there is no end. The there, there is uh, only multiplication of of means, uh, and after a while, uh, you should get tired. You get, and then you get tired. Yeah. Then what? <laughs> yeah. And then I'm what? Still, I'm right? still it not begs painting. The <laughs> I'm still not living. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you also mentioned about the insatiability of human desire, which I think is so good. And I talked to a lot of leaders. And I think we all struggle with this, right? Like we're very blessed with the downloads on this podcast, but is 30 million enough? What about 60 million? What about 100 million, mm-hmm. right? Uh, a church grows. It's like, well, now we have three locations, but why don't we have eight? Or now we have eight. Why don't we have 20? Or hey, I heard of a church that has 44. Can we have 45? <laughs> you know, there, there's an insatiability. You're never satisfied. Appetites are always hungry. What do you speak to that? Um, how 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 do you deal with an unsatisfied appetite? Yeah, in some sense, this is a this is an uh, ancient human phenomenon. One sees it, for instance, in Ecclesiastes. Um, all rivers flow into the yeah. sea, and seas never fall, never satisfied, right? Yeah. And so is yeah. also a, a human heart. But we also live in environments in which competition and increase is one of the key drivers of life. Indeed, the same sociologist, Hartmut Rosa is his name, who I mentioned earlier, he speaks of acceleration and expansion as being key features of the modern life. It has You have to do it faster. That's true. You have to uh, go bigger, wider, and and uh, and bigger and everything is uh, uh, predicated on increase. If you stop, you're uh, you're actually falling behind, and uh, that puts incredible pressure uh, on on us. And I think it's really important, uh, just for that reason, to not to be satisfied with means, with fame, with numbers, with. Mm. Um, wealth with uh, whatever else it may be looks and I suddenly start tinkering with the way in which I which I look and the cosmetic surgeries have no end uh, and this is one one mm-hmm. example uh, only of what what is going on and uh, which means we need to for from my perspective we need to find the the proper ends proper goals what is it that gives fulfillment? To us, and we then to need to nurture this sense of um, contentment. And sometimes I even hate to mention the word contentment because if you say the word contentment in a positive sense, people say, "What contentment? Well, I can't just stay where I am. Do you want me to not to uh, progress, not to improve?" And suddenly you have a long lecture uh, to listen how contentment is this crazy vice that we that we um, uh, that that I'm trying to peddle, and yet at the same time, mm. how can you have a happy life? How can you have a satisfied? Mm life without certain sense of contentment. And um, Mm -hmm. I think restlessness often is fed because we search for wrong ends. And once you come to realize the proper end of your striving, satisfaction comes about, a certain peace comes, and then one can rejoice over what is and not Mm -hmm. always complain about what isn't and strive to uh, to reach that uh, that point and 
great religious traditions, whether that's Buddhism, whether that's uh, uh, Confucianism, and Christianity, certainly, and Judaism, they have resources for that. They all are aware of that problem and, and seek to address it. And that's why I think we need to pay attention to what these traditions say, particularly in our moment. How, as, as you've worked through this material the last eight years and written a really beautiful book, actually, and I, I want to ask you about your writing style before we wrap up, but uh, how have you become more content, to use that word? What, what difference has teaching this course, thinking these thoughts, writing this book, and I'm sure it's been a multi-decade pursuit for you along these lines, what qualitative differences have you noticed in your life as a result of asking these questions? Oh, to, to me, what, what has become um, more important uh, over the years, and in the light of the study of various issues that you described, is to not let myself be defined by my neighbor who is slightly better than I am or significantly better than I am, but to stay with the good that I can affirm and I have uh, experienced. Um, I think struggle for superiority is one of the one of the uh, in terribly crippling, in some ways uh, energy-giving, but at the same time very crippling um, ways, to, uh, ways to live because it creates permanent uh, dissatisfaction in my life. Um, mm. And the sense that uh, there is a time to strive and there is a time to be at rest, to rejoice over what is. And uh, to me, there was a discovery a few mm. years back, maybe 10 years back or so, that that's really what Sabbath is about. Sabbath is about mm. joy wow. of what is, over what is, whether that's God over whom mm. one rejoices, uh, over the gifts that one has. That is the joy of that need not, nothing mm. needs to change for it to be there. Six days, you'll tinker, you'll improve, and so forth. But take one day <laughs> to rejoice. I translate that mm. into uh, actually segments of a day. Segments of an hour. Strive, mm. but so, rejoice. Oh, okay. <laughs> so strive, and then at 5-2, take a break and give, give thanks. thanks. And look back. And don't look back, oh, what, I haven't, what haven't I done? but recognize the goodness oh of what has been there, goodness of what even you haven't done but surrounds you. Um, suddenly allow the good that exists, created by you, created by God, created by others, um, uncreated, <laughs> which is God, be at the forefront of, of attention at the forefront of memory also. And it transforms one's life. Now, it, it could be that one has to be 66 years old, as I am, to practice that <laughs> when one is 35, that that kind of striving comes very much naturally and joy over what is, uh, less so. But nonetheless, I find it uh, really liberating. That's a really powerful thought, and I had not seen Sabbath through that lens exactly before. I must say, the book, it's its long, but it's just delightfully written. Um, you know, I love the depth of your thinking. That's what made me want to do this interview. But when I got the book, it's just, I think somebody in the sixth grade could read it. You and your co-authors had a beautiful way of condensing highly complicated thought into very digestible, easy-to-understand sentences. I'm pretty in awe of that. And uh, it's called uh, Life Worth Living, A Guide to What Matters Most. So any final thoughts as we wrap up today? Yeah, I, I think... Um, 
for me, a really important question that is there surrounding everything that I do is how do I honor the beauty of God-created humanity and its worthiness in my own life and in the life of others. This is the really, if you put it in um, non-religious terms, if you put it in uh, kind of ordinary terms of ordinary life, this is really at the heart of our human, ought to be really at the heart of our human struggle. And I think that's why we wrote the book. And that's why we took a great pains at writing it in a way that would be interesting in, and, uh, and readable to people. I myself, uh, I need to be uh, to give honor where honor belongs. I myself, uh, by myself, could not have written that book. Uh, my co-authors uh, are extraordinary communicators, and they have been instrumental in making this book uh, to read in a way that I find also myself um, easy and delightful. And I think, wow, this, this, uh, this sentence was put quite right. I couldn't have put it quite that way, even though my name is there behind it. It's a beautiful hybrid of really complex thinking simply and beautifully expressed. So Miroslav, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast. And I have more unasked questions than questions we actually ask. So perhaps you'll write another book and we can have a round two at some point. Um, if people want to track with you, um, what social channels are you on? And is there a website you would do? Yeah, you know, the to? book has its own website. And on that website, uh, the, there is a uh, kind of developed a discussion guide for if wants to if person wants to read the book uh, in uh, uh, with friends and uh, in a group it's called lifeworthlivingbook.com lifeworthlivingbook all one word dot com and yale.edu slash faith is uh, the uh, website of the center and one can follow most of the things that we do right there but thank you so much for this conversation it's been absolutely a delight and a thrill for me. Thank you, Miroslav. Yeah, you're, you're a wonderful conversationalist. <laughs>